In this video, we're going to look for the domain of the following power series. And remember, we think about power series as functions. So we want to know really what values of x are we allowed to actually evaluate this function or this power series at. And what that means in a practical sense is what values of x actually lead to a convergent series when we plug in those values into the power series. So the way in which we approach these problems for power series and asking about their domains is the first thing we really do is apply the ratio test. And the ratio test is going to give us basically a big bulk of the actual domain that we're allowed to actually evaluate these power series at. So let's go ahead and apply the ratio test. So the ratio test is we take a limit of the next term in the series divided by the previous term in absolute values. And depending on what that limit comes out to be will tell us whether or not this series is convergent or divergent. So for us with the ratio test, the new thing for power series is we get to choose values of x to make sure that we're landing in this case where the power series is absolutely convergent through ratio test. All right, so let's first define each of these quantities. So for applying, uh, for applying ratio test, our next term in the series is basically the previous term, but anywhere there is an n, we replace with an n plus one. The nth term of the series is basically just what we're given in the original series itself, x plus two to the n in this case, all over n squared plus one. All right, so let's take those two quantities, take the ratio, take a limit, and do the ratio test. So doing the ratio test, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of these two quant of the ratio of these two quantities. So in the numerator, we have this as x plus two raise the n plus first power all over n plus one quantity squared plus one all divided by the nth term x plus two raised to the n all over n squared plus one. And the way in which I like doing these types of problems is rather than start simplifying from this stage, actually doing the division by this fraction in the denominator. So reciprocating and multiplying just so we don't make any silly um, algebraic mistakes. So just multiplying now by the reciprocal of that fraction in the denominator, we have this is an n squared plus one all over x plus two raised to the n. So from here, we could start collecting similar terms in order to reduce this or simplify. So we can rewrite this as x plus two to the n plus first all over x plus two to the n times n squared plus one all over this n plus one squared plus one. So from here, we can see that in this first term, we'll get a factor of x plus two raised to the n will cancel out of both the numerator and denominator. So in the numerator, we're just going to be left with this factor of x plus two. So rewriting this limit now, we have the limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value of x plus two times this other quantity of n squared plus one. And all I'm gonna do is distribute basically this n plus one into n plus one. So just doing that distribution in the denominator, we have this is x plus two times the quantity n squared plus one all over n squared plus two n plus one plus one or a plus two. So we're almost at the stage now to do this limit, but there's a few other things that we could do. So for example, or do first. So for example, this x plus two factor, it does not have any n's attached to it. And since we're taking a limit as n goes to infinity, that limit's not going to affect this factor. So we're just going to pull it out of this limit. So pulling out the absolute values come along with it. So we have x plus two in absolute values. Now times the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of n squared plus one all over n squared plus two n plus two. 
And remember, what we want this whole left-hand side to come out to is something less than one because that will guarantee its conversion. And just where we're going for is this X value, we're gonna be able to choose to guarantee that this whole left-hand side is less than one. All right, let's not get ahead of ourselves though because we get to do this limit first. So what happens in this limit as n goes to infinity? Well, this numerator, it looks like infinity because you have n squared. This denominator also looks like it's heading towards infinity. So we have this infinity over infinity in determinant form. So we get to do L'Hopital's rule. Let's apply L'Hopital's rule. So this x plus two comes along for the ride. We have the limit still as n goes to infinity. These absolute values, we actually don't need them anymore because the numerator and denominator here are always going to be positive no matter what this limit comes out to. So just getting rid of those absolute value signs, let's apply L'Hopital's rule now. So L'Hopital's will take the numerator and take its derivative. So derivative of n squared plus 1 gives us a 2n. Now taking the denominator, the n squared plus 2n plus 2, and taking its derivative separately will give us a 2n plus 2. All right, so in this case, we've done L'Hopital's once, so we can compare the growth rates of the functions and the numerator and denominator directly towards each other. Let's reevaluate this limit. So as n goes to infinity, will this numerator... Again, this numerator looks like it's heading to infinity because 2n approaches infinity as n goes to infinity. And similarly, for the same reason, this denominator also looks like infinity. So again, we're falling into this indeterminate form, which suggests we can do L'Hopital's again. So let's go ahead and do L'Hopital's. The absolute value of x plus 2 comes along for the ride. We have the limit again as n goes to infinity. And now doing L'Hopital's once more, we look at the derivative of the numerator and then derivative of the denominator separately so we can compare their growth rates. So in this case, the derivative of the numerator, that is a 2. And the derivative of the denominator in this case, the derivative of 2n plus 2 with respect to n, well, that is also going to be just a 2. So we have now this fraction of 2 over 2, which will reduce to just 1. So let's see what we have now. We have x plus 2, the limit as n goes to infinity of now just the number 1. And well, the number 1 does not depend on n at all. So this limit just comes out to 1. So we just have now x plus 2 by itself. And now if we remember from the very beginning when we do L'Hopital's rule, what we care about from L'Hopital's rule is, or when we do um, ratio test, excuse me, what we actually care about from ratio test is what this limit turns out to be. So right now what we basically have done is we've done this limit of the next term in the series over the previous term, and it's given us this quantity of just x plus 2 by itself. So what we want to do at this stage for finding the domain of the power series is we want to set this less than one to guarantee that it's going to be convergent. And like we said before, we get to choose x values to make this happen. So again, when we did this limit through ratio test. This limit came out to just x plus 2 in absolute values. And what we're doing now is saying, well, what we want that limit to be is less than 1 so we can guarantee convergence or absolute convergence in this case. So we're going to basically find x values that make that happen. So next step, we take what that limit was, in this case, the x plus 2. We set it less than 1 to guarantee that we have an absolutely convergent thing. And next, we're going to choose x values to make sure that this happens. So we have an algebraic e equation that's an inequality with absolute values. So there's two sides of this that we basically solve. We solve one side, which we just have x plus 2 is less than 1, so-called what we have in the original statement, just without the absolute values. But the next thing that we do is we take x plus 2, 
And we solve it for when those values are greater than the negation of the right-hand side, or x plus 2 is greater than minus 1. All right, so let's solve these two inequalities. So on the left-hand side, subtracting 2 from both sides, we get x is less than minus 1. And on the right-hand side now, when we subtract 2 from both sides, we get x is greater than minus 3. So at this junction, what x values seem to be allowed in the domain are values of x between minus 3 and minus 1. So I'll just say, so far, what x values are in the domain? So if we choose any x value strictly between minus 3 and minus 1, not including the endpoints yet, because we haven't addressed that, we'll be guaranteed that we can put them into our power series. But what we still need to do is test the endpoints. So this is step two now. Because right now, what ratio test guarantees is basically that any value between minus three and minus one, if not including the endpoints, we're guaranteed to converge if we put those x values into our power series. But ratio test can't tell us what happens when that limit is equal to one. So actually by testing the endpoints, we're gonna explicitly figure out what happens because if we put in those x values of minus three or one into ratio test, it would have gave us an inconclusive result. So let's first test these endpoints. So let's test, I guess, the endpoint at minus three first. And the way in which we test the endpoints, we go back to the original series and basically plug in that endpoint into it. So our original power series is from n equals zero to infinity of when we substitute minus three into it, it'll be minus three plus two raised to the n all over n squared plus one. So when putting that value into our power series and doing a little arithmetic, we get the series from n equals zero to infinity of minus one raised to the nth power all over n squared plus one. And if now, if we're gonna include x equals minus three into the domain of this power series, this series must converge. So we get to ask ourselves, what tests would we be able to use to actually figure out whether or not this series converges? And well, one thing that's useful for us in this case is we have that minus one to the nth power in the numerator and nowhere else in the series do we get sign changes besides the fact that that minus one to the n is there. So we're actually gonna be able to use this alternating series test. So for alternating series tests, there are two parts for it. The first part, is we want the limit of the positive stuff in the series to go to zero. So for alternating series tests, the first part that we do, we ignore the minus one to the n contribution. We take everything else in the series, in this case, the one over n squared plus one. And what we'd like to see is whether or not that this series or this function goes to zero as n goes to infinity in this limit. So let's actually take a look at this. Well, looking at this infinite limit now as n goes to infinity, this numerator is just staying as a one, a value of one. Meanwhile, though, this denominator as n goes to infinity, that denominator looks like infinity. So the situation that we actually have at hand, if we're thinking about this, is this sort of looks like to us a finite number all over infinity. So that denominator is getting very, very large while that numerator is just staying constant. So what this looks like then to us is this limit is equal to zero. So that first criteria for alternating series test, that checks out. The next thing that we need is that the terms of the series are decreasing. So again, going back to the alternating series we're given, 
in this in this prior to the problem, what we need to figure out is that the next term of the series is smaller than the previous term when we ignore all the negative one to the n contributions. So in this case, what we can do is one of two things. We can do this algebraically, or we could do this with some derivatives. Let's practice some derivatives. So the series function that we're given without the minus one to the n is the one over n squared plus one. Again, that's what we just took the limit as. Now to actually take the derivative of this, we need to think about not n as an integer, but we need to put values of x that are real and we actually have a more continuous variable in there. So we'll look at this function in the following way. Basically replacing the n's by x's to say, hey, we now have this continuous real variable x that we can take derivatives with. So our function just looks like one over x squared plus one. And I'm just going to rewrite this in the following way. So we can write this as x squared plus one raised to the minus one power. And then now what we can do instead of a quotient rule is we can do some chain rule differentiation. So taking the derivative of this function and looking at this last kind of equivalent form of the function, we have some quantity raised to the minus one power. So first we do power rule. So with this minus one comes down, then we have the original thing that's there, x squared plus one, and we subtract one from that power. Lastly, what we need to do then is take a derivative of what's inside those parentheses. So a derivative in this case is just a two times x. So rewriting the derivative of this function f, we get this as minus two x all over the quantity x squared plus one raised to the power of two. And now what we need is that this thing is less than zero for x values greater than zero. And well, where that greater than zero is coming from is that's basically because this series starts at n equals zero. So we're hoping that values for x greater than zero make this always decreasing. And well, what we can see is when we look at that numerator, any x value that's positive, because that minus sign in front of the two, will always cause that numerator to be negative. Whereas because we have that denominator being squared, plus we only have positive stuff in that denominator, that denominator is always going to be positive. So we have an always negative number all over a positive number. So indeed, this is also decreasing. So what this tells us by, in this case, the alternating series test, is that the point when x equals three should be included in our domain of um, convergence, or in this case, what we call the interval of convergence. So, so far, what this looks like now is we're allowed to put three into the power series. So we have three is less than or equal to x, which is less than one. So you might see where we're going next. We get to test this other endpoint when x equals minus one. So let's go ahead and do that now. So when x is equal to minus one, let's see what happens. Again, the way in which we do this, we go back to our series function or our power series in this case, and anywhere there is an x, we're gonna plug in a minus one. So instead of having x plus two, we'll have minus one plus two, Now all be over n squared plus one. So what this series looks like when we do out the arithmetic, the resulting series looks like from n equals zero to infinity of just, oops, that should be to the power of n, is just a one to the n all over n squared plus one. Well, in this case, because we have just a one to the n in the numerator, that's actually just a one for us. So now, just to take us back, what we're wondering is, should this point, x equals minus 1, be included in our domain or not? And in order for it to be included in our domain, we need this resulting series to be convergent. So we get to test this series now, whichever way we would like using any series test that is appropriate. So what I think we should do is just practice setting up a comparison test. <clears throat> 
So a comparison test, remember, we can think about this as having kind of a couple different parts to it. The first part being, we need to find a series to compare to. And you might see where this is going, but if we find a series to compare to, we take our series that we're wondering about. And one way we think about this is what terms are contributing most to the numerator, what terms are contributing most to the denominator, particularly for very large values of n. So we think, well, for very large values of n in the numerator, well, there's only one term, it's just the one. In the denominator, we're looking at for large values of n, which terms contributing more, the n squared or the one? And well, that's gonna be the n squared. So in this case, the series we'll compare to will actually be the series from n equals zero to infinity of one over n squared. And you might see something fishy right now is, well, we're starting at n equals zero here and we have an n squared in the denominator. This series blows up if we include that first term at n equals zero. So what we're actually gonna do for this comparison test is remember, whenever we have a series, we can always take off a finite number of terms at the beginning, and that's never gonna affect the, end, the other part of the series in which it converges or diverges. So we're actually going to think about not the series starting from n equals zero, but we're going to think about the series for n equals one. So in other words, what we're actually going to do is take our series that we're starting with, the one that really does start at n equals zero, the one over n squared plus one, we're going to write out the first term just when n equals zero, the first term of that series is one. And then we have the series from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared plus one. And what we're going to do is compare that series starting at one to the series that we just found that we want to compare to. Again, that's because if we take off just a finite number of terms from our series at the beginning, that's not going to change whether or not the rest of the series converges or diverges. All right. So we found the series we're going to compare to, just the series now from n equals 1 to infinity. We need to ask ourselves, what does the comparison series do? So in this case, looking at that comparison series from n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n squared. Now, what we do in this case is assess how can we do this. This is usually a p-series or a geometric series. In this case, this is a p-series with p equals 2. And since p is equal to 2, which is greater than 1, this is a convergent p-series. So we're going to compare our series to a known convergent series. And why that matters is in step three, is if we're trying to compare our series to a convergent series, we need to show that our series is always less than that known convergent series. So we're going to try and show this through some algebra. So what we want to show is that our series function that we care about, again, 1 over n squared plus 1, we want to try and show that this is always going to be less than or equal to the series that we're comparing to, which in this case is 1 over n squared. And again, we care about this for n values from n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. So in this case, we basically need to show that this is correct, that our series or each term of our series is less than or equal to the six, the um the other term in the series we're comparing to. So in this case, if we do a little cross multiplication here, we get n squared. Again, we're trying, hoping that this is less than or equal to what's on the right-hand side, cross multiplying the n squared plus one to the right-hand side. We get this is less than or equal to possibly n squared plus one. 
we can cancel out the n squareds. And what we see is, well, zero is less than or equal to one. That checks out. So our series, or each term of our series, is less than or equal to the other term in the series we're comparing to. So putting this all together, we can conclude that the series we care about is convergent. So since every term of our series Again, we're starting at n equals 1 here is less than or equal to the term of the the terms of the series we're comparing to and the fact we know the series that we're comparing to converges our series must also converge. So to take us back, again, we're wondering about, are we allowed to put in this value of x equals minus one into our power series? And it turns out since when we put x equals one into our power series and explicitly test that value, we actually do get a convergent series. So what that means is x equals minus one is included in our domain. So what the domain looks like in this problem is the final domain is from minus three, including that endpoint to minus one where we include that endpoint as well. So any x value inside of this domain will result in our power series converging. The other thing I just want to mention is when we find this domain at the end of the problem, this is what we call the interval of convergence. And it's called the interval of convergence because any x value within that interval we're allowed to put into our power series. It results in a convergent series. The other bit of information that we can uh, put into this is going all the way back to where we ended our ratio test. Once we have this setup where we have x plus or minus a number, like in this case is less than one, this one on the right hand side, well, this is what we call the radius of convergence. The idea being for the radius of convergence is if we are centered at the point x equals minus two, and we extend our arms in the radius of convergence amount in each direction. So in this case, if we extended our arms one unit to the right and left, those values that we would be able to grab so in this case, to x equals minus one, and this case, to x equals minus three, any x value within those arms, we could say is gonna be convergent in our series. The only thing we didn't know about is what happens right at the endpoints, which is why we tested those endpoints. But nonetheless, the radius convergence basically says, if we, when we are centered, at that point that we're centered at in our power series, and we extend our arms in each direction from that point we're centered at in the radius of convergence amount, we're guaranteed to have a convergent series or those X values are allowed. The only thing we don't know is, are we allowed to put in the endpoints? Basically the points that our fingertips touch right at the ends.